Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. Welcome to Season 4 of the Endless Knot Podcast, Episode 61. Oh, 61, is it? Yep. Mm. So we've been doing this for three years, and we're starting on our fourth. Wow. Now, seasons don't really mean anything, but it's <laughs> <laughs> a way for us to kind of keep track. And so welcome to a new year, starting in September, barely, assuming I managed <laughs> to edit this in time to get it out by September. We are looking forward to a new year of podcasting, as we said in the last episode, probably at a slightly diminished frequency from last year. But hopefully we'll still have some quality episodes that you will enjoy listening to. Indeed. So today we are going to be talking about education. That seems appropriate for September, even if we did mean to do this <laughs> yes. a little earlier it's just when school started. Barely a back to school episode, but you know. Hey, I think the UK is just about to start back to school. Oh, hey, well, okay, this is for our, <laughs> our UK crowd then. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about an older video, a video from last year, actually, about education. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to talk in particular about how to teach or ways of teaching Latin, mostly. Yeah. Ancient languages in and after antiquity. But before we get to that, quickly a few pieces of admin. First of all, we want to thank our Patreon supporters. In particular, we'd like to say welcome back to Klaus Jensen. And thank you to DSM, a new Patreon supporter, who, by the way, runs a great YouTube channel. Indeed. All about... All about language. And etymology. And etymology, yeah. So if you like our stuff, I would definitely recommend you check hers out. I'll put a link in the show notes, but you can also just search DSM on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And certainly if you search DSM and etymology, I'm sure you will find her. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Emma Louise, and I hope people check out your wonderful videos. Indeed. Second, we mentioned last time that we're going to be going to, or that we hoped we might go to, and now we are confirmed that we are going to, <laughs> a conference right at the beginning of November, November 1st to 3rd. It's going to be held in Harvard, and it's an educational podcasting conference. Mm -hmm. And not only will we be attending, mm -hmm. but we are now participating in this conference. Yes, we elbowed our way into the panels. <laughs> We are going to be on two panels between us. Both of us are going to be on one called Professors Who Podcast, where we're going to talk about professors who making podcasts, podcasts. Yes. and the sort of challenges of doing so, the reasons for doing so, and maybe some of the reasons that pod or some of the ways that podcasters can make their material more useful for professors in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And then I'm participating in a panel all about linguistics podcasting. Mm -hmm. So there'll be, you know, me and a bunch of other podcasters who cover topics about language and linguistics, and we will be talking about how we do it, I guess. Mm -hmm. And how to make that information valuable accessible for people and, and yeah. accessible. And mm -hmm. So that will be, both of our panels will be on the Friday, which is the day of panels for about podcasting. That's November the 2nd. On November the 3rd, are public talks by the podcasters. So you can register for just one day or for the whole conference. But if you wanted to come on the Saturday and listen to the podcasters um, giving live versions of their shows or talks about podcasting to a general audience, not just to podcasters, mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be on Saturday. And there's lots of big educational names going to be there. And I think on Thursday, there's a workshop on the Thursday evening about podcasting, about starting a yeah. podcast. So we're going to be there for Friday and Saturday. If anyone who listens to this is going to attend, please let us know because we'd love to meet up with you, say hi. And if you are interested in it, go to soundeducation.fm and you can learn lots about it, all the names of the presenters and podcasts involved and many more details there. Definitely recommend you check that out. All right. So now on to the cocktail. Indeed. It's orange in color. <laughs> Thank you. It's very important to describe the visuals yeah. for uh, this audio <laughs> medium. I haven't tasted it yet, so I don't know how it tastes. Now, this cocktail is called the classic cocktail. I looked so long and hard to find ones that were about education or school <laughs> or language and could not find anything. So we went for classic cocktail because we're going to be talking about classics, I guess, and teaching Latin. And because it was an excuse to go and buy cognac, which I don't think mm. I've ever bought for the house before. <laughs> no, we've had brandy, but never cognac. Never cognac. So, cheers. Interesting. 
The first sip, I thought it was just all Luxardo. Yeah, that's what I'm getting. So the combination is cognac, Luxardo, maraschino liqueur, Grand Marnier, and lemon juice. And I found after the first one, a lot of the sort of bitterness and the more complex notes come through. I'm not getting as much of the citrus as I would have thought, given that there's both lemon and, and orange and orange mm-hmm. liqueur. There's the warmth of the cognac and sort of the aftertaste. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think if I made it again, I might drop the maraschino liqueur proportion. Yeah. Because it was two ounces of cognac and then half an ounce each of the other ingredients. Mm. And I think I've always find the Luxardo very, very I strong. like it, but mm. it's very, very strong. I think I would probably drop that amount and I think that might balance it a bit. Mm-hmm. The citrus is fresh lemon juice. We're used to using the bottled lemon juice. Uh, the fresh lemon juice isn't as strong, I think. You right. know, isn't as, as acidic. Hmm. So that might be part of it. But I like it. It's And it is a sort of old-fashioned. Old-fashioned as in, well, fashioned, not as in the cocktail old-fashioned. No, as in fashioned in the old, old way. way. Yes. <laughs> that kind of old-fashioned. <laughs> this is a recipe adopted for, adapted from a 1930 the Savoy Cac- cocktail book. Ah, okay. Which we actually have. I found this online, but we right. have that Savoy cocktail book or a, a reprint of it. You know, it's it it is classic in that sense. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, hopefully that'll help us help lubricate the tongue for talking about <laughs> language. Well, and you know, the drinking aspect may come up a bit later in the <laughs> discussion. Nunkest bibendum. <laughs> All right. Well. Why don't we start then by listening to the video, yep. the, the audio for the video, the voiceover for the video about education. Right. And it's sort of a history of education, a little bit of a very truncated, very simplified history of, of education. Mm-hmm. And then we'll come back and talk about it. Great. The word education comes from Latin ex, meaning out of, and ducere, meaning to lead. So literally to lead out of. Latin educare had the root sense of to bring up or rear a child, literally leading them out of childhood. But since the main job of child rearing is education, I suppose, the word gained its more specific sense. But thinking about this etymology helps us to understand education and its history in a number of ways. Because it can be said that the history of education is the history of civilization. One of the purposes of education is to perpetuate and extend a culture's values and knowledge into the future. So therefore, the content of education is culturally specific. Education reflects societal values. And so we can think of education as a kind of leading or directing in more ways than one. And we can see similar notions in other words to do with education, such as the Germanic-derived word learn. It comes from the Proto-Indo-European root leis, meaning track or furrow. So the underlying sense here is to gain experience by following a track. Closely related is the word lore, something that is learned. And similarly, the word curriculum, closely related to the word course, literally means a running, coming from the Proto-Indo-European root kers, meaning run. So let's follow the track or course of history of education in the Western world and see where it leads us. Formal education, based around the written word, really begins in the Western world with ancient Greece, after the introduction of the alphabet. And when we're talking about education in ancient Greece, due to the nature of our sources, we're really talking about the city of Athens in the 5th to 4th centuries where students from citizen families could receive a basic, relatively low-cost education preparing them for citizenship, oratory, and ethics. So it's no coincidence that the birthplace of Western democracy valued civic responsibility so highly that their educational system was largely geared towards preparing young elite men for public life and taking part in the democratic process. However, it should be stressed that this was not state-funded education, but paid for through tuition fees to private tutors, so not everyone could afford it and it was intended for only those who were allowed to participate in the democracy, Athenian citizen men, not slaves, foreigners, or women. Only Sparta had a publicly funded education, and it was primarily in the martial arts, not academics. In Athens, physical education, academics, and arts were covered in different schools. The paidotribes, from pais meaning child, since the whole point of education was transforming young boys into men, covered gymnastics and general physical education. The Kitharistes, named after the kithara or lyre, covered music and lyric poetry. And the Grammatistes, unsurprisingly, taught reading, writing, and arithmetic, as well as literature. And accompanying these young boys to school as attendant and guard was a slave known as Pedagogos, meaning literally child-leading. From this we get the words pedagogue and pedagogy, even though originally that slave didn't actually teach the boy he attended. 
We also get the word encyclopedia from this child root. The phrase encuclios paideia referred to a general education, literally meaning circle of child rearing. And from this general education idea, it was eventually turned into a word for a book of general knowledge. But getting back to the Greek education in Athens, after the basic course of schooling, students then had the option to go on to higher education, either in a practical art, such as medicine or architecture, or in philosophy. And this is where the famous teachers such as Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle come into the picture, as they each founded their own school. These were really just groups of students who met in some often outdoor location to listen to the teachings of their masters. Plato's students happened to meet in a grove honouring the Athenian hero Academos, and so his school came to be known as the Academia, and that's where we get the word academic from. Moving from Greece to Rome, we can see a strong continuity in educational practices, with an emphasis on rhetoric and oratory, important to Roman public life in their republican system, though physical education and music dropped out of the main curriculum. And it's from this period that we get the beginnings of the notion of a liberal arts education, because in Latin liberalis meant free, so a liberal education was an education fit for freeborn people, not slaves, though in practice it was much more available to the higher classes. And of course education is still a classist institution today, though we often pretend it isn't, with the better schools in the richer neighbourhoods and university tuition fees restricting higher education to those who can afford to pay for it, and different types of universities open to people with more money. And this is a notion that's also expressed in the word school itself, which comes from Greek schole, meaning leisure. It wasn't that school itself was leisurely, but that to be able to go to school one had to have the leisure time away from working, the leisured class as it were. The Romans had a similar notion in their word for school, ludus, a word which could also mean play, game, diversion, and that leisure was possible in large part because both Athens and Rome were slave-owning societies, so the leisure to go to school was dependent on a large and very unleisured class. Later on in the Middle Ages in England we find the distinction between the learned and the lay or lewd, both lay and lewd ultimately from Latin laicus, from Greek laicos, of the people, from laus referring to the common people. In the Middle Ages education was mostly to be found in the church, hence the learned lay distinction, and if you weren't educated you were lewd, a word which in later times gained a distinctly pejorative sense. One of the major differences between Roman and Greek education was that girls often received some education in Rome. Roman education was divided into three levels. The teacher of the first level was called the ludi magister, literally schoolmaster, and taught the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic to boys and girls from about 7 to 11 years of age. After that, students aged 12 to 15 would be taught grammar and literature by a grammaticus, and then boys over 16 could move on to the rhetor to learn rhetoric. Girls wouldn't go on to that level though, since they'd have no opportunity for public speaking. Many if not most of those teachers would have themselves been slaves or ex-slaves, so again the leisure that allowed the students time to learn the liberal arts was a direct result of labour by slaves. Given this history, it's not surprising that much of our educational vocabulary comes from Greek and Latin, but we also get some from Germanic sources, such as the word teach which comes from Old English tachan ultimately from the Proto-Indo-European root dake, which means to show, and is closely related to the word token, etymologically something that shows. Also from this root comes the word dictionary, the Latin word dictionarius being coined in the 13th century by an Englishman, John of Garland, who taught in Paris and wanted to create a resource to help his students learn Latin vocabulary. In any case, this shows something about how teaching often works, the teacher shows the students. For the students, of course, this can mean a lot of work, and that's etymologically appropriate because student comes from Latin studere, meaning to be eager, take pains, strive after, thus implying great effort, and is ultimately from a Proto-Indo-European root steu, meaning to hit. Appropriate perhaps to how often ancient teachers beat their students if they didn't apply themselves to their studies, also from Latin studeo, with adequate eagerness. Of course, teachers shouldn't only be thought of as strict taskmasters, they also care for their students, as the word tutor implies, coming from Latin tueri meaning to protect, the educational sense of the word was a much later development. Pupil, another word for student, is the diminutive form of pupus boy and pupa girl in Latin. There's a flavour of small cuteness in this root, which also gives us puppy and puppet, and Latin pupilla could also be used to mean doll, 
from which, believe it or not, we get pupil in the sense of the dark aperture in the eye, because if you look in someone's eye, you can sometimes see a little doll-like version of yourself reflected. In Latin, the main word for student was discipulus, from which we get disciple, as in the students and followers of Jesus. This word comes from the Latin discera, meaning to learn, ultimately from the Proto-Indo-European root dec, meaning to take or accept. And interestingly, this root also leads to the Latin word docere, meaning to teach, which gives English the word doctor, the highest class of teacher I suppose. So now that we've got the students and the teacher, we've got the whole classroom ready. But where does the word class come from? Well, it's etymologically an interesting one, coming from Latin classis, which originally referred to the Roman people under arms, in other words the army or fleet. The underlying sense is a call to arms, as the word comes from a Proto-Indo-European root meaning to shout. The word eventually broadened in sense to refer to classes or groups of people, and then groups of anything. In English it came to refer to a group of students around 1600, but we also have the older sense of the word in such expressions as social class. It also came to refer specifically to the highest class of something, hence classical, as in classical music, supposedly the highest genre of music originally used to distinguish the music of Mozart and his contemporaries from the later music of the Romantic period, and later still to make a distinction between the older music and the music of the 20th century and beyond. In literary circles we similarly refer to classic literature, implying it's better than all this modern stuff. But this also points us towards the importance of the classical world, that is classical Greece and Rome, to our story of education. When ancient culture was rediscovered during the Renaissance, it was referred to as classical, implying that it was better than the medieval period that had followed, and when it was all readopted and copied we refer to that period in the 18th century as neoclassical, and so that's what we refer to as a classical education now, an education in the culture of the classical world, not necessarily an education like students received in ancient times, though it was something of a return to the Greek model downplaying all the theological education of the medieval world. So the education of the early modern period involved classical languages like Latin and Greek as well as the natural sciences. So what about education in that medieval period? Well the main educator at that time was the church. Students could attend a monastic or cathedral school in order to become a member of the clergy or to become a scribe. As the values of society shifted, so too did the emphasis of that education. Whereas Greek and Roman educations emphasized public life and citizenship, the medieval education was all about preparing not for this life, but for the next life after death. Physical exercise was out, and textual study was definitely in. Students were taught reading and writing in Latin, not their own native language, and they would spend their time copying church writings. However, the basic subjects still came out of the ancient period in the form of the seven liberal arts, first codified in the 5th century by Martianus Capella growing out of that Encuclios Paideia circle of education of the Greek world. The seven liberal arts were made up of the trivium, grammar, rhetoric, and logic, and the quadrivium, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. We still today talk about a liberal arts education or liberal arts college. In fact, our highest level of education today, the university, comes to us from the Middle Ages, and the origin and etymology of the university reveals a certain irony about the state of education in our society. Part of the impetus for these new institutions of higher learning was the high demand for education outside of the cathedral schools that increasingly were unable to keep up with demand. So groups of students and teachers began to spontaneously congregate in large cities such as Bologna in Italy, Paris in France, and Oxford in England. But there were a number of problems with these growing schools. Unscrupulous schoolmasters could cheat students by taking their money and running, or by pretending to have mastery of subjects they didn't really know. And as students gathered in the towns, unscrupulous locals saw their chance to raise the costs of rooms and food sky high. So the students began to band together the first student unions, if you will. Similarly, the teachers themselves were concerned with maintaining the standards of education and wanted to regulate their profession in the manner of the other medieval trade guilds, the forerunner of the trade union. You might have thought that the word university reflects the idea of universal education or the universal coverage of subjects, but it's short for Universitas Magistorum et Scholarium, the scholastic guilds or corporations of students and masters. They were self-regulating and wanted to protect their own interests against outside forces. 
There is an irony of the origin of universities in collectives that were trying to reduce the financial barriers to education and protect the livelihood of the teachers, given the growing corporatization of universities today, the rising cost of tuition, and the reduction in wages and job security for university teachers. There is a growing need, therefore, for new ways to make learning at all levels more accessible, picking up on those ancient ideals of education as essential to every citizen, but without those ancient restrictions on who counts as a citizen. One important way this is happening is with things like this very video. Educational YouTubers bringing their knowledge and enthusiasm to as many people as possible for free. Ah yes, that's why we chose a classic cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> All of the discussion of the word classic in mm -hmm. class and mm -hmm. everything. I knew it was an incredibly intelligent and, <laughs> and appropriate choice. I just briefly forgot. <laughs> So I have one last etymology to add to that. I mentioned that the Greek philosophers slash teachers would meet with their students in these various open air spaces, public places basically, that weren't specifically schools. But, right. And so we get the word academy from the grove of academos and so forth. Well, another school, Aristotle's school or his, his group of students, met with him at a place known as the Lyceum or Lycaon mm -hmm. in Greek, because it was held at a grove near the temple of Apollo, who had the epithet Lycaos, which meant wolf slayer. Wolf related, yes. Wolf related, yeah, yeah, anyways. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's uh, formed on the Greek word uh, leukos, yeah, yeah. meaning wolf. Think lycanthropy. Right? Oh, yes, Werewolfism. everybody thinks of lycanthropy. <laughs> so this is the thing we all say. We all say that word. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, so that's that wolf word. And so, because of that, a number of educational institutions today, often secondary schools, are called lyceums. Right. Or lycee in. French. Right. Yes. Where it's, I think, even more common even more still. Common. Yeah. Okay, good. Hmm. So it's a very uh, compressed version of the history of Western education, <laughs> but mm -hmm. it covers the big broad strokes of it and some of the interesting cultural differences. We wanted to talk in particular about language training today, mm -hmm. because that's something both of us do and have done, which is teach languages. Specifically, we teach dead languages. Yes. Which historically has been done differently than teaching living languages. Indeed. So I wanted to start with talking a little bit about teaching, not dead languages, but teaching classical languages in the classical period. Uh -huh. Not, as your voiceover talked about, not teaching them to native speakers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously Latin speaking children did go to school and learn the alphabet and learn to write and learned Latin. Mm -hmm. But they already spoke Latin. Yep. So, as a learned, native speaker, sort of, I guess, proper Latin. They for learned formal the, grammar. They learned for public use. They learned formal, yeah, rhetoric, formal and all of that. speech patterns. They learned literacy yep. and to read, and they learned to copy and and work with literary conventions. All of those things, the mm -hmm. same way we learn English when we're mm -hmm. native English speakers. But that's not what I want to talk about. In the ancient world, after the Roman Empire, sort of expanded, uh -huh. <laughs> she says euphemistically, into other parts of the Mediterranean, you know, conquered them by force, you ended up with populations, quite a lot of populations, who were not native Latin speakers, who were nonetheless learning Latin. Uh -huh. So that's th something I'd like to talk a little bit about, because that's more analogous, it's not quite the same, of course, but more analogous to what happens when we teach Latin now. Mm -hmm. So when we're teaching Latin now, we're teaching them to non-native Latin speakers, mm -hmm. and the techniques for doing so are therefore different than teaching you know, literacy to students who aren't native speakers. And we actually have some decent amount of information about how that was done, which is sort of interesting. Now, there's kind of different ways this happened. Obviously, as Latin expanded, as the Roman Empire expanded, in many places, people started to take on Latin as a second language and teach it to their children as a first language. Mm -hmm. So a lot of places in the West in particular, West, Italy and West, Latin either coexisted or displaced native languages, right? So that's obviously where we get the Romance languages from. Right. <laughs> All the places that adopted Latin 
And so while they might still be having to teach their, their children formal Latin, which was diverging more and more from spoken Latin, nonetheless, people were transitioning to native speakers. So that's not really what I want to talk about, because that's become, you know, there's a transitional period, sure, but pretty soon you move on to people in Spain are learning Latin as a first language, even if they also keep a Celtic language or something. In the Greek East, however, so in the eastern half of the Mediterranean, where Greek had earlier displaced or become a co-language with native languages there, so after the conquest of Alexander the Great, Greek becomes the lingua franca of the East and either becomes the native language in various areas of the East or becomes a, a co-native language. So you have Greek speakers all there. They did not, in general, become native Latin speakers. So you don't have that transition to native Latin speakers. However, because Latin maintained was still the language of government, at least in part, and you know, there were lots of reasons for economic and social reasons that you might want to learn Latin. People were teaching their children Latin and some adult learners too, probably, but in particular teaching their children Latin, but as a second language. So that's where we have that parallel to what we do now. Maybe they were teaching them earlier, but basically you're teaching a bunch of Greek speakers how to speak Latin. Now, it's not a dead language, so it's not like it is now. On the other hand, they were teaching them the formal written literary Latin, not vernacular Latin. So the Greek speakers in the East are not learning, you know, what will become Spanish and what will become French and what will become Italian. They're learning the, you know, governmental Latin mm -hmm. of Cicero, even after Cicero's time, you know, mm -hmm. they're continuing to learn that formal Latin. So in a way, they are still learning something very close to what we teach our students. Now, what is the age of those students? That we don't have a necessarily a very good sense of. I suspect a lot of them were children. Okay. Because people would want their kids to learn. You know, it was like learning, maybe in Canada, learning, uh, wanting your kids to learn French from a young age so that when they grew up, they could take a government job. Right. right? You want them to get to a functional bilingualism. So you just enroll them in French classes as well as English. All the way along. I suppose there might be other parts of the world where you do that with English because you want yes. them to be able to lots of places. Function I think on an international level or whatever. But you're never thinking of it as a replacement for their native language. No. You do, they continue to do most of their schooling in their own language, but mm -hmm. then they also learn uh, another language. Um, so yeah, that seems to be it. But it's hard to tell because we don't have like systematic textbooks that explain or people writing about this and explaining mm -hmm. it. It's just a part of life. What we do have, though, is in Egypt in particular, we have papyrus evidence of the actual school exercises. Okay. So, you know, we have what they were doing. We don't have who was doing it, mm -hmm. but we have what they were doing. So I thought I would talk a little bit about, um, in particular, there's been work done by a number of people. One person who's done a lot of work on how Latin was taught to Greek speakers in the ancient world. A, a lot of work's been done by Eleanor Dickey. There's a book called Learning Latin for End Greek from Antiquity to Present, which I will link in the notes. It's available on archive.org that has a number of articles. But one of the articles is by Eleanor Dickey entitled Teaching Latin to Greek Speakers in Antiquity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so a lot of what I'm talking about is taken from that. What we have is evidence of systematic teaching of Latin as a second language through papyrus remains. And what we can see in there is three subsets of exercises. Okay. So what we're looking at is scraps of papyrus that survive rather than, uh, or, you know, and sometimes a fair amount of work, but nothing, we, we aren't looking at things that have been copied out into manuscripts and given headings and explained what their use is and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we have to reconstruct what they are mm -hmm. from what we can see. But we have three basic types of things. We have transliterated texts. So texts where you have that are aiming clearly for oral proficiency. Those are probably more often for adults who want to be able to master enough Latin to get by, mm -hmm. but they don't want to learn how to read Latin. They need to know how to pronounce and say Latin, what the Latin words are for things they need to do. Right. And then we have elementary materials for learning the Roman alphabet and literacy. Those are almost certainly mostly for, for children. Mm -hmm. And then we have advanced texts, that is sort of continuous texts, either purpose written or actual Latin authors with glosses and things that make it clear that they were learning texts. Okay. okay. So the transliterated ones, actually, I found really quite fascinating. 
just because it's so backwards to my brain, because of course I work with the Latin alphabet, what they are is they're lists of Latin words. So you have the Greek and then in one column and then parallel to it in the other column is the Latin word, but transliterated into Greek letters. Mm. So that for a Greek speaker who knows how to read Latin, read Greek, but doesn't know how to read the Latin alphabet, they can see the word, you know, they can see the word animus, soul, written out in Greek letters, right? So they'll have psuche, animus, but both in Greek letters. And they have just lists of this. And in fact, the lists that we have are often, as Eleanor Dickey puts it, they're like phrase books that you might buy. If you go to Japan, you would buy a phrase book mm -hmm. that had phrases in Japanese transliterated into English right. so that you could pronounce them, Yeah. right? So you can say, arigato. Mm -hmm. Even you have no idea what that looks like, but you know how to say it and you know it means thank you. So the, exactly the same thing. And they're the, very much the same things. They're, they're like conversational phrases. Hello, pleased to meet you. How are you? Can you please help me? You know, there's some legal ones or, or ones that of the sort of circumstances, military, a whole bunch of military words, that kind of stuff. I like the way you trilled your R there. When speaking Japanese. Yeah, I don't speak Japanese. Because it's not at all how the Japanese are. I know. I know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. I'm not Japanese. Well, I mean, it does matter, but I don't speak Japanese. Yeah. I just, I know that word. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, Japanese speakers. I apologize for mangling your language. My point being, I bet you those Greek speakers mangled their, their Roman, mm. their Latin pretty badly too, because if you're doing that transliteration, you're not going to get, I mean, Greek does not perfectly transliterate Latin. Mm -hmm. We've talked about it in that in your alphabet and your spelling, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. there's different sounds. So you're going to get them pronouncing it poorly, yep. but it's going to be enough to get be understood. So you can see the kind of proficiency that's aiming at. And we also have uh, grammatical tables that are done like that too, where the so like paradigms, paradigms, okay. but again, with the Latin transliterated into Greek. Into Greek. Okay. So that they can understand, okay, this is how you say he sits, she sits, they sit, right. we sit. All right, I got it. And because Greek and Latin tend to have very similar types of forms, mm -hmm. there doesn't need to be a lot of explanation. Those grammatical tables don't have a lot of labeling. They just have the Greek and the Latin side by side because right. you'd be able to understand it. Unlike an English speaker learning Latin where you have to be explained like what the hell's going on with cases or something now, you know, like our well, students now, now yeah. need, yeah, mm -hmm. need to have all this explained. A Greek speaker didn't. And they were the same cases except for the case of the ablative. One of the lists of Latin words, by the way, that we have has a, at least one text has a list of Greek words, a list of Latin words transliterated into Greek, and a column of Coptic words. So clearly some of these were for somebody who maybe didn't have enough Greek to learn Latin, but could learn it mm -hmm. from Coptic. So you know, you can see that the native populations of various language backgrounds needed to learn a certain amount of Latin, and that's what these materials are for. So that's, there's nothing sophisticated going on in pedagogy there. Right. These are just things you can consult, you memorize a bunch of words. Now, the elementary stuff for learning literacy, also a very sort of straightforward approach. Would We have quite clearly exercises where the master writes out the alphabet in order, mm -hmm. and the student copies it out multiple times underneath. And then sometimes they'll have a line or two of verse, you know, of poetry or something where they write it out to give them a practice at writing it in context. And we have a lot of those kinds of school exercises that just survive on little scraps. Right. So that's, again, nothing, nothing we would call advanced pedagogy there. Mm -hmm. Memorization and repetition. Once you finish your learning your Latin letters and the alphabet and how to read them, you would move on to purpose written learning texts. And this is where we find some interesting stuff. A lot of stuff written for learning. Mm -hmm. short conversations and narrative texts. Those are the standard ways. So they, there's a whole bunch of these that we have, some of them on papyrus, some of them collected up and used, and they become standard learning texts in later generations and are copied into manuscripts later yeah. on. And and what is the sort of content of those? They are everyday things. They're the market or right. talking, to, talking to a friend or okay. soldiers talking to one another. They're very much about everyday, everyday things ordinary events in those kinds of conversations and narrations. And basically what you do is the student would memorize the passage and then they'd recite them to the teacher right. or they might perform them as a group or they might write them out again. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't translate them, mm. if you see what I mean, necessarily back into Greek or we don't have very much evidence of that anyway. In general, Greek speakers didn't need the cases and the inflections and verb tenses and things like that explained to them because most of it's very parallel, except for the ablative. 
Yeah. By the way, they, I think some of the verb tenses may also be slightly well, problematic. Well, yeah, but mostly it's that Greek has more than Latin has, right? So the Latin doesn't have the optative, mm -hmm. whereas Greek has the optative. But that's not that hard. You just say, here's the subjunctive. You have the subjunctive. We have the subjunctive. Right. The subjunctive does some things your optative does, you know. It, but the ablative case did need to be explained because Greek doesn't have an ablative. Right. So sometimes they divided it into two cases. One, the ones that had the same use as the genitive does in Greek, and one that had the same use as, as what the dative has in Greek, right. because functions of the ablative are split between the genitive and the dative in Greek. So uh, sometimes they, like some of the versions we have, actually explain them as two separate cases that mm -hmm. are exactly the same, but mm -hmm. have different uses. Right. And then you would move on to reading actual text from literary sources. So we have, in particular, Cicero and the early books of the Aeneid. Eleanor <laughs> Dickey says that it seems quite likely that most Latin students, like many today, only make it through the first couple of books of the Aeneid and never make it past, because <laughs> we have tons of exercises right. from the first two to four books of the Aeneid and almost nothing from after that. <laughs> And what we have is uh, we have some glossed texts where mm -hmm. there's written and, and some that are clearly glossed by a student hand. So, right, you know, yeah. you, they're, they're writing their little words just like we do now. Mm -hmm. But we also have glossaries that are associated with specific text. So lists of words in the order they appear within the Aeneid. In the text. In, okay. in the text. Right. Not in an alphabetical order, but in the order that they appear. And then other glossaries, some lexica. Mm -hmm. So that is sort of early dictionaries where it, words for a particular text are arranged in an alphabetical order mm -hmm. and some grammars as, as well. So there were standalone grammars too. So we do have some evidence of written out translations of Greek into Latin, like that's composition, mm -hmm. but no, not a lot of clear evidence of people making up Latin from sort of nothing, you know, composition. But of course, that's going to be hard to trace. But they did seem to do some composition, some translating from Greek into Latin. So you have a passage okay. in Greek, and then they have to turn it into Latin, right. which is a, something uh, my students don't do very much of, but is a very traditional way of, of teaching mm -hmm. still. Everything I've said basically is very similar to what you might still see in a classroom now, with some exceptions. There's less of the sort of everybody write out the alphabet 25 times right? and that kind of repetition. We do less of that. But otherwise, most of that's the same. What you don't see is grammatical commentaries set aside from translation. So you know how explaining. Yeah. Where it's like, what's going on here is the genitive of objective genitive or mm. what, the, what, you know, make sure you notice that this word is actually modifying that other word or whatever. Right. We don't see that. Sometimes those grammatical notes in the margins of a glossed text, mm -hmm. but nothing standalone. And they don't seem to have done translations of individual sentences, which a lot of textbooks now right. have, where yeah. you'll just have one standalone one. sentence and then you translate that and then mm -hmm. another. So when they were translating or reading, they were doing it with continuous text of right. some amount, but many purpose written ones, mm -hmm. which is very common in textbooks now. Mm -hmm. None of that's really shocking, but it's interesting to see how, among other things, it's, I don't know whether it's, it's comforting or horrifying to realize how very similar the practices then mm. were to practices that are not in every classroom now, but very common still in classrooms today. Mm -hmm. Some might say that that's because they work. Others might say that's because we haven't advanced very far <laughs> from you know, the pedagogy of that period. That's really what I wanted to point out. There's other kinds of evidence of this in some places, but we really don't have direct evidence outside of Egypt because the materials don't survive. Right. Well, moving forward then, I want to talk a little bit about language teaching in the Middle Ages. In particular, I'm going to talk about Anglo-Saxon England, which is in some ways, you know, basically the same as learning Latin mm -hmm. in medieval Europe generally, though in some ways different as I'll discuss a little bit. So much of the teaching materials that they used to teach... So Latin, by that point, was was a basically a, a dead language. Mm -hmm. Put it this way, it was the second language of everyone who used it. Yes. It's not quite dead in that people are still making up new words for new concepts and using it, but there's really no... There's nobody who speaks that kind of formal Latin as a native language. No, no. So in that way it's... Yeah, different. sort of, because if you're talking the sort of earlier Middle Ages, like Anglo-Saxon Yeah, it's England, very much on the sort of cusp, whether you still call it Latin or not. Well, they at the time did. Mm -hmm. They didn't 
make a formal distinction between French and Latin. Mm -hmm. They would talk about the sort of proper literary Latin or whatever, mm -hmm. as opposed to the way people speak it. And people sort of complain people don't speak Latin properly anymore. Yeah. So here's yeah. how to do it right. Yeah. So for the most part, what they had to work with, <clears throat> initially anyways, were monolingual Latin grammars. So Latin grammars written in Latin, mm -hmm. which right. obviously is not of much use if you're starting out from scratch, mm -hmm. right? And you, you have those, um, those, those advanced grammars that I was talking about from the classical, from Egypt are like that too. Mm -hmm. They label everything in Latin. The labels and the content are in Latin. Yeah, in Latin. And they are clearly therefore meant for more advanced learners who've mm -hmm. gone through the first sort of stages. So based on that, these must have been supplemented orally with some kind of bilingual method, at least to some extent at first, mm -hmm. until you get the students up to the point that they can then kind of work with these grammars. They also had glosses and glossaries of various types. Mm -hmm. So English to Latin. And they had colloquies, which are, as you described, sort of uh, conversations. Mm -hmm. Made up for the purposes of teaching. Of teaching. Mm -hmm. And so what you would do is you would have to memorize the colloquy and presumably read it out loud. Or probably not, maybe read it out loud, but probably perform it out oh, loud. Oh, perform it out loud. Yeah, you were to memorize it yeah, is the yeah, idea. Yeah. Not read it from a thing. And uh, you'd get in trouble if you hadn't memorized it. So mm -hmm. you would be given a chunk of it at once and told to you know, memorize these 20 lines 20 before lines, tomorrow. Whatever. Yeah. This practically made sense because parchment is expensive. So mm -hmm. you would write down the, the bit you were supposed to memorize on your wax tablet, memorize, memorize it. it and move on. Yeah. And yeah, not, and everybody doesn't get a book. No. Now, once you go past the basics, there was obviously more advanced study of grammar and that would be done in the trivium. Mm -hmm. which is very much based on kind of grammatical, analytical work of language. Yeah. That, that's the main point of the trivium. Yeah. Uh, the, the quadrivium, you'd go to learn all the sciences and whatnot. But mm -hmm. in the, in the but trivium, you'd learn about language. language. Yeah. Yeah. The two main grammars that they had to work with are basically inheritances from the uh, late antique period. So there's Donatus, uh, grammar by Donatus. Mm -hmm. he, that was produced in the fourth century. And it was written for Roman boys, so native speakers of Latin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the idea would be to give them the vocabulary necessary for discussing properties of Latin at elementary stages of their training in oratory, because that's the, the next step in a Roman boy's education would mm -hmm. be you Moving on to, to public speaking. Public speaking. Yeah. So it's basically getting you to the point where you can then start learning um, public speaking. Mm-hmm. So this is L1 learning, first language learning. Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, in the Middle Ages, we're talking about L2 learning, second language acquisition. Yeah, which is very different. Which is very different. So they're using these textbooks written for a very different purpose, mm -hmm. but that's what they had yeah. to work with. Yeah. A little later on, the other grammatical text that became popular in the Middle Ages was by Prishan. That was produced in the 6th century. And it particularly addressed the need for materials, learning materials at higher level of L2 competence. So you, at that point, mm -hmm. you would already know the basics mm -hmm. and it's so to, to get more advanced. Mm -hmm. Prishan was originally writing for Greek-speaking learners of Latin, so second language acquisition. Right, right. So the, that's what we were just talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the Donatus text began to wane in the beginning of the ninth century in favor of the Prussian textbook, basically. Okay. So moving from L1 to L2, learning styles. Yes. Now, again, the, the early stages of learning Latin must have been uh, oral instruction. They would do things like commit daily prayers and the Psalter to memory, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. Oral instruction and, as we were saying, like writing on tablets writing on and tablets, stuff, things that just memorizing. don't survive, so yeah. we, we don't have any. Yeah. Now, there was an interesting article that I read, it's a 1995 article by Margaret Thomas, that basically looked at the role of what an understanding of language universals, essentially a universal grammar, right? how that in affected the way language was taught in the Middle Ages. Okay, so what did they mean by a universal grammar? Well, in a sense, something not that different in practice from what I suppose many people understand it today. Okay, but explain that. So the big part of it was things like parts of speech, partes orationis. Okay, how is that universal grammar? 
I don't understand. Like, I don't know what, what you mean by universal grammar. Well, <laughs> no one understands what anyone means by universal well, no, grammar so, but, these days. But you, well, so, explain what she means by universal grammar. So universal grammar today, the idea is that certain elements of language are universal to all natural languages. Mm -hmm. And those sort of elements or constructs are kind of built into our, well, we're given them by genetics is the idea. Right. Okay. But that's not what you mean when you're talking about a medieval understanding of universal language, universal grammar. Well, it is because they seem to realize that, hmm, all languages have the same parts of speech. All languages are made up of nouns and verbs and okay. adjectives and pronouns. Right. Okay. So there's something that all languages possess. Which, of course, is all false, but was true within the languages they were talking about. Yeah. In those terms, that yeah. is, whatever the true universal grammar is or isn't, not all languages have nouns and verbs and... Well, some universal. linguists today will, will say that, yes, categorization is are, are universal. But the same categories? Some of them. Not all of them necessarily, but there are basic categories that they think all languages possess. Okay. We won't get into discussing universal no, grammar. No, there, there, are, there are other... Okay, so that's the basic premise that you're talking that idea, about yeah. right now as, mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as what you mean by a medieval understanding of universal grammar is that all languages have some basic categories. Yes. And they can make parallels between them yes. when learning. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. So for instance, Roger Bacon in the 13th century says, grammar is substantially one and the same in all languages despite its accidental variations. Right. And so they had this idea that language was hierarchically organized into units from letters to phonemes to syllables to words to sentences. Okay. Now, the difference between what's sort of understood by universal grammar now and what was kind of understood as universally true of, true language. of all language mm -hmm. is the source of that structure. Right, right. Where it comes from yeah. and why those things exist. So now those who mm -hmm. posit the idea of a universal grammar say that it comes from art genetics. Mm -hmm. For the medieval thinkers, the source was the nature of existence, not an innate language faculty. Right. So in other words, God. God and the way that he created the universe that we live in. Yeah. So nouns exist because stable objects exist. Right. Verbs exist because Verbs exist because, exist because exists. there is temporal changes. Right. And processes and things that happen. Right. So in any case, L2 learning, second language learning, both influenced and was influenced by these ideas about, you know, a medieval sense of, of a universal grammar. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, in particular in the later Middle Ages. Right. In terms of what linguists today think about universal grammar, the role of whatever universal grammar is mm -hmm. in second language acquisition is actually disputed, or certainly was when this article was written, mm -hmm. and there may be some more consensus on it now, but basically those who posit a universal grammar basically agree that that universal grammar is important for first language acquisition. Mm -hmm. What hasn't been as well established is what role it plays in second language in a acquisition. second language right. acquisition. Mm -hmm. So in other words, are second languages true natural languages or do they constitute some other kind of intellectual skill? In right. other words, are you kind of translating always? Yeah. Do you have to use different parts of the brain? Do you have yes. to use different mechanisms to learn a language, second language? And what we mean, just to be clear here, when we talk about second language acquisition, we do not necessarily mean a bilingual person no. who learns two like So you can learn, say, three languages as, as native as, languages. As L1s. Probably not more than three, but you know, at least yeah. two. Many, many people learn two languages mm -hmm. simultaneously as from 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 birth, birth. as yeah. natural languages. So we're not talking about bilingualism or multilingualism. Yeah. So when we talk about a second language, the point there is one that you learn after later in life. Yes. And that can be as early as you know age four or five, but one that you don't learn through immersion in. In family in, in, in a family environment. Yeah. So you might learn a language, for instance, from a carer, mm -hmm. and that can still be an L1. Yes. Even if it's not your parents' language. Say you're cared for by someone who speaks a different language and who speaks that to you mm -hmm. from you know early, early childhood, from mm -hmm. infancy. That could still be an L1. Yes. An L2 is one that is taught in some to some degree in a formal way. Yes. Even like so even our kids learning French in French immersion in school would be still it's, considered it's an L2 yeah, even L2. though they're trying yeah. to do a sort of semi-natural language approach to yes. it, you know, yeah. of just immersion and but it would still be considered an L2. Yes. That's so right. just 
just to clarify that because that's not mm -hmm. necessarily obvious. Okay, go on. And in fact, there is evidence that L1 and L2 acquisition are different in that they are stored in different parts of the brain. So okay. we, we can tell this from doing MRI, um, scans, MRI and scans and so forth. It is also, of course, important to keep in mind the difference between uh, child and adult learners. Right. So we don't know exactly where the threshold <laughs> is, but there is some sort of threshold that you learn languages differently, say, before 10 mm -hmm. Ish, yeah. though or even that after some twenty ish. Like some linguists this. are challenging that to yeah, some extent yeah. as well. So these things are there's mm -hmm. not a lot of consensus on no. a lot of this stuff. No. But I can imagine that most linguists would be like, yes, if you're exposed to it, say around age four, that's definitely different than being exposed to it at age forty. Yes, you know. But where the borderline comes and mm -hmm. how it changes, yeah. So, you know, as you get towards really the end of the Middle Ages, there were grammarians, they're basically speculative grammarians. They're known as the modisti, and this is particularly in the 13th and 14th century. And they're sort of, as opposed to the sort of traditional pedagogical grammarians, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of, I guess, a bit like what we would think of as, as the philosophy of language. So that's where all these kind of new ideas were coming from. Okay. These, 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 these people who are working on that. Yeah, these modisti. But going back again to Anglo-Saxon England in the earlier Middle Ages, so I mentioned that Latin and the local Romance vernacular or, you know, vulgar Latin or whatever it was at the time. Was considered Latin. Yeah. So, well, I guess it's not surprising that it was Germanic scholars such as Alcuin, an Anglo-Saxon who, you know, he was from York, but he got hired by Charlemagne for his court, for his uh, big educational program, mm -hmm. who was one of the early people to start seeing that difference between, make particular note of the difference between Latin as it was, as it existed in a literary format. The formal Latin that people were learning, yeah. And the, the way people were talking. Because they have more. an outside perspective. Yes. Because they speak a language that is, that is not, not descended a from it. Language. Yeah. 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 That cannot be seen as a variant of Latin, of Latin, no matter how hard you push it. <laughs> That's right. And as we'll see later, it is therefore not surprising that English grammars, once they started to be produced, English, I should say, Latin grammars written in English, right. were the first to be written as bilingual grammars, not just... Where the instructional information is in is one in language yeah. and the content, content is in the, is other, the language. other language. That's right. But before we get to that, I, I need to say a few words about King Alfred. You always need to say a few words about King yeah. Alfred. <laughs> now, he had an educational program. He did not produce... Did he have some really pretty jewels that he sent around <laughs> to people with them by any chance? I will, I will get to that. No, people, you talked about that in the last episode. Did I? Oh. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll mention okay. it again anyways, because it'll it'll come up in a passage that I read. Okay. Remember, you talked about the, the one at the Ashmolean. That's right, the, yeah. the Ashmolean, yes. So, I mean, he didn't pr produce any grammars. What he did produce were translations either written by himself or by others that he sort of commissioned. Of Latin works into English. Into English, yeah. Now, in terms of his own education, by his own account, which he gave in prefaces to his translations, mm -hmm. and in his official biography by Asser, we are told that he learned by memorization. So, for instance, there's his mother had a, a book. It's actually a book of English poetry. And she said, whoever can learn this the first uh, among, you know, her children gets to have the book. And he was, although the youngest, he quickly did it first. <laughs> Won the book. Now, his translation program, this mm -hmm. tells us a little bit about how kind of things worked, the way that he translated, as opposed to maybe some of his more learned advisors, he translated by having a bit of text explained to him by his helpers. He would then go away and meditate on it and then render it into English. Hmm. So just let it seep into his brain and then redo it as English. Basically. Right. Now, in his own words, he says sometimes he translates word by word, a word by word, and sometimes meaning by meaning. Sense by sense. Sense by sense. Yeah. Now, that's a, a that's long a debated, a, you know, what a, does that mean? Yeah. And can you even really ever do that's that a in very translation? That's trope, yeah. basically. Yeah. yeah. But he was always regretful um, that he hadn't learned Latin as well as he would have liked. Right. And presumably he was trying as an adult because he wanted to do these translations. Mm -hmm. And he um, felt that that's what education consi yes. consisted of. Yeah. You had to know your Latin. Yeah. And so that's why he also wanted to have people, you know, trained in Latin. He himself didn't learn to read until 
he was 12 years old, according to his official biography. And when he says read, do you think he means in English or in Latin? Probably in English. You think they read in English first before they read in Latin? I think so. Okay. Well, here's what he says. So here's the story about his his mother. One day, therefore, when his mother was showing him and his brothers a book of English poetry, okay. which she held in her hand, she said, I shall give this book to whichever one of you can learn it the fastest. Spurred on by these words, or rather by divine inspiration, mm -hmm. and attracted by the beauty of the initial letter in the book, Alfred spoke as follows in reply to his mother, forestalling his brothers, ahead in years, though not in ability. Will you really give this to the one of us who can understand it the soonest and recite it to you? Whereupon, smiling with pleasure, she reassured him, saying, Yes, I will. He immediately took the book from her hand, went to his teacher, and learned it. When it was learnt, he took the book back to his mother and recited it. So that's English. So yeah. that's English. Yeah. It also says in his biography, uh, from the cradle onward, in spite of all the demands of the present life, it has been the desire for wisdom more than anything else, together with the nobility of his birth, which have characterized the nature of his noble mind. But alas, by the shameful negligence of his parents and tutors, he remained ignorant of letters until his 12th year or longer. Yeah, blame the parents. <laughs> blame the teachers. At least his mother gave him a book, finally, I guess. <laughs> so that gives us at least something of an idea of what education would be like for someone of the noble class, mm -hmm. anyways. Mm -hmm. In his preface to the pastoral care, that's where he describes his, his method. So that's his mm -hmm. first translation, the pastoral care. And here he says, When I recalled how knowledge of Latin had previously decayed throughout England, and yet many could still read things written in English, I then began, amidst the various and multifarious afflictions of this kingdom, to translate into English the book which in Latin is called Pastoralis, in English shepherd book, sometimes word for word, sometimes sense for sense, as I learned it from Plegmund, my archbishop, and from Asser, my bishop, and from Grimbald, my mass priest, and from John, my mass priest. After I had mastered it, I translated it into English as best I understood it, and as I could most meaningfully render it. I intended to send a copy to each bishopric in my kingdom, and in each copy there will be an astel worth 50 mancuses. That astel is the, the Alfred, Alfred jewel. jewel that you right. talked about. So it's a, it's a reading stick, basically. The, the jewel is, is the, de decorative at the end. Decorative yeah. at the end, and then it would, would have been attached to a stick which you would have moved along the page to read. So he goes on to say, and in God's name, I command that no one shall take that astle from the book, nor the book from the church. It is not known how long there shall be such learned bishops as, thanks be to God, there are now nearly everywhere. Therefore, I would wish that they, the book and the astle, always remain in place unless the bishop wishes to have the book with him, or it is on loan somewhere, or someone is copying it. He's uh, setting up for the long dark age that will follow him <laughs> when the priest won't be as well educated. As well educated, yeah. So basically the idea behind this education program is produce a bunch of important texts in English as a kind of jumpstart to learning. And then people can move from that to Latin. So those who then become, who show themselves to be particularly good at it, can then go on to learn Latin and so that they can read the wider range of the, text yes. because that's really what he's he seems concerned with. Yeah. That there's a lot of wisdom written down in books, but most of it's in Latin, so mm -hmm. people can't get at it. So yeah. translate some and then lead them mm -hmm. on to learning so that they mm -hmm. can go and read it in the Latin. So this all suggests that literacy is an easier job. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. which it, makes which sense. is true. Literacy is an easier job than learning a whole new language. Yeah. Literacy in your own language is easier than yeah learning another language. Yeah. yeah. Now, it's in that environment that later on, Alfrich produces his, his grammar. Right. So there is already this existing tradition of, of English translations of Latin books floating mm -hmm. around to help the general level of education. So Alfrich produces a grammar, a bilingual grammar. It's the first Latin vernacular grammar. First grammar of Latin in a vernacular. In a vernacular, where the instructional material is in a vernacular language. Okay. Yeah. yeah. As far as we know. And as I say, it was it was influenced by Alfred's translation program. Mm -hmm. They know English, and if they can be taught to read English, then you can use you English can use to, teach, English to Latin. teach Latin. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be explicitly aimed at children. I mean, mm -hmm. Alfred says so in the book, first of all. And an article I read by Jay Fisher argues that 
the way it's put together is clearly keeping child learners in mind. The way that children are what children need in order to be yeah. able to learn. Right. And specifically, he says that Alfrich is using child directed speech. Hmm which is a concept that we have now uh, in terms of language learning in children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he uses this method. It has certain methods that are common to that and to what Alfred uses, such as, you know, Mother Ease avoids syntactic transformation. I'm raising my eyebrows. You can't see that audience, but I am indicating, please explain further what that is. <laughs> so for instance, Alfrich sometimes renders passive voice in the Latin into an active voice in English. So it was seen... He sees. He sees. Yeah. Okay. He uses vocabulary relevant to children in his paradigms. So the example words the he example uses words to show how use. grammar works, yeah. he uses like, um, maybe not cat and dog, but equivalent to equivalent cat and to dog that. and ball and yeah. chair. He, he and uses things like uh, either words that are used in a classroom environment, like teaching and learning, mm -hmm. uh, or common objects that they right. would. And he doesn't give detailed pronunciation instructions. It doesn't try to, you know, explain, well, you do this with your tongue or, you know, whatever in, in really kind of mechanical terms. I mean, no textbook. I've never seen a textbook that does that. Well, they, they might give a as in this word in your language or something right. like that, right? Yeah. No, they never tell you about how to do things no. with your tongue, though. No. no that was not. a very linguist thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> Only linguists talk about how to use your tongue. But it's, I mean, as, that kind sorry. of pronunciation instruction, <laughs> pronunciation instruction is included in those monolingual Latin grammars. So he leaves that out. He's, okay. he's basing his grammar on those monolingual Latin grammars, and he's leaving stuff out. From it, from because it, he because doesn't seem it's, he, it doesn't yeah. be, it isn't applicable. Yeah. Okay. Now, he couldn't have matched every synthetic Latin form to an English form, particularly with the verbs. Because there's just, they were different There's so many tenses in Latin that English just, you doesn't know, it, have, with its two tense didn't system. Didn't have at didn't that have. time. Yeah. yeah. And I, I haven't actually looked it up, but I should look it up sometime what he does with the ablative. Because, I mean, Old English did have a case system, uh, but again, it's the same problem, you know, nominative, accusative, genitive, dative. Yeah. What do you do with the ablative? Yeah. For instance, with the verbs, he doesn't translate idiomatically. So he paraphrases rather than translating word for word. So he might use an adverbial expression rather than repeating an Old English form that is most approximate to the Latin form. This is significant with the future tense because Old English did Didn't not have, have a one. Tense, right. So the normal way, if you were just speaking of the future in Old English, you would just use the present tense form. But he doesn't just give the present tense again. You know, he'll give the present tense for the present, the Latin yeah, present tense. Yeah, but he won't tense. do it again for the he future because for the that future. will be kind of confusing. That'll be kind of confusing. Instead, he sort of describes what the Latin usage is in the vernacular, not translating literally. So for the verb stabo, he would say, ich stande nurricht otha on sumna timan. So, I stand right now or in some time. In some time, like in the future. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, I'm a, in other words, I'm about to stand or I will stand at some point. Okay. Basically, okay. what that means. <laughs> You're not doing a very good job of translating it, but okay, I <laughs> well, get it. Well, let's say what it literally says. And so, steti, for the imperfect, he'll just give the, the normal past tense in English. Mm -hmm. But for steti... For the perfect, perfect, the perfect, mm -hmm. he uh, translates that as each stood fulicha, I stood perfectly, basically. <laughs> I stood fully. Yeah, fully, in a complete manner. Yeah, in, in a, a completed complete manner. manner. Yeah. yeah. Which is what the sense of the perfect is. Mm -hmm. It has been completed. And for the pluperfect, steteram, he translates that as each stood yefirn, I stood once. Hmm. Right. Now, these various constructions, these, you know, little adverbial mm -hmm. phrases mm -hmm. and things are generally not found in actual Old English usage outside of this grammar. So this is so like weird. So they're not really un... idiomatic. They're, they're ways idiomatic. of making it yeah. distinguishing one tense from another without explaining mm -hmm. the full concept of perfective aspect versus... Yes. Right. Right. He's explaining the sense, not trying to recreate the Latin system in English, right. in other words. Now, in addition to this grammar, he also produced a colloquy. Now, there were many mm -hmm. colloquies, as I said, these con conversation, mm -hmm. uh, these little little mini plays, sort of. Mm -hmm. Alfrich's colloquy, I'll 
read the sort of opening of it because it'll give you an idea. Alfrich's colloquy is sort of basically there's a frame device uh, that it starts out with, uh, a conversation between pupils and their teacher. Mm -hmm. And the pupils say, Master, we young men would like you to teach us how to speak properly and with a wide vocabulary, for we are ignorant and badly spoken. <laughs> the teacher replies, how would you like to speak? And the pupils say, we are concerned about the way we speak, as we want to speak correctly with and with meaning, and not with meaningless base words. Would you beat us and make us learn? For it is better for us to be beaten to learn than to remain ignorant. However, we know that you are a kind-hearted man who would not wish to inflict blows on us unless we ask for them. Oh my god, that is twisted. <laughs> I am not pleased with this. This is not my pedagogy, people. <sighs> And so the teacher goes on to say, I ask you to tell me what work you do. I am a monk by profession. I sing seven psalm psalms during the day and spend my time in reading and singing. But, however, I should like you, in the meanwhile, to learn to converse in the Latin language. What skills do your workmates possess? And all of this is in Latin. All of this is in Latin. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the people say, some are plowmen, some are shepherds, others are oxherds, hunters, fishermen, fowlers, merchants, leather workers, salters, bakers. And the teacher says, can you tell us, plowmen, how you do your work? And then they describe each they describe, sort of everyday yeah. actions they take. Yeah. So I guess each student takes on the part of you know, one, one of takes the plowman, one takes on the, the hunter, and you know, each one describes this is what I do in my day. Kind right, of thing. right, right. So that encompasses a bunch of vocabulary that yes. you need. Yeah. yeah. And so, again, it's everyday life stuff. Mm -hmm. So the there's rest of it lot, is- a lot. Interesting, though, there's a lot of complicated grammar in that. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about the order in which we teach grammar. There's would you like to, there's yeah, conditionals, yeah. there's subjunctives, you, like that, yeah. you know, there's it's mm -hmm. in, indirect speech, there's a d bunch of different tenses and things. It's just mm -hmm. interesting that it's not, uh, the vocabulary might not be too extreme, mm -hmm. though there's going to be a lot of very technical vocabulary in yeah. that as you describe your days. Yeah. But it's also quite um, a lot of clauses and things for, yeah. for early speech. Interesting. Now... What's particularly interesting is that there is a copy of this colloquy in which some student, no doubt, has written the glosses in. For, All the Old English or uh, bits of Old English. Bits for... of Old English, yeah. And in fact, it's a complete gloss. So every word is marked hmm. in, in mm -hmm. the glosses. So we now actually, interestingly, therefore have an Old English text of this. Right. So that gives you a whole bunch of vocabulary you might not otherwise have in yes. Old English because you have such a small amount of text in yeah. Old English. Yeah. And so, you you know, many uh, introductory Old English textbooks use that to teach Old English. Old English to students. It's <laughs> nice and re yeah. <laughs> reversed. They've, yeah. it, you know, someone along the way rearranged the word order so it made, made better English better word in, order. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Now, another, another set of colloquies was written by one of Alfred's students, mm -hmm. Alfred Batta. And these, so, you know, Alfred's linguistic stuff is very much, you know, of the church setting and, you know. Monasteries and stuff. Monasteries and stuff. And yes, there are the everyday professions and mm -hmm. so forth. But it's, you know. It's a church school. It, yeah. Alfred Batta, I guess, seems to have a bit more of a, a raunchy uh, <laughs> turn of mind. <laughs> So he wrote colloquies with different kinds of subjects. So I'm going to read a bit from a web article by Kate Wiles that sort of describes some, some of Alfred Bata's colloquies. Mm -hmm. Bata's colloquies are intended for students to learn Latin through the use of dramatic scenes in which aspects of daily life in the classroom are played out. In a normal day, the master or his helper would give each pupil a passage of about 40 lines to memorize and recite back the following day with the threat of beating if this was not performed satisfactorily. As well as allowing students to play out the roles of teacher and student or farmer and tradesman, Bada writes of monks throwing alcohol fuel parties, negotiating kisses from women, riding into town to get more beer, and going to the privy with younger pupils unaccompanied. His <sighs> scenes often directly break the Benedictine rules to which Bata and his pupils were expected to adhere. In one quality, he sets out a dialogue between master and pupil in which they exchange a vast array of scatological insults, including the memorable, may a beshitting follow you ever. 
Right. Certainly his pupils were not going to forget the relevant vocabulary. <laughs> Though they would never be able to use it again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I know a lot of Latin scatological vocabulary as well, but I just wonder how often they needed to use it for <laughs> translating the Bible. <laughs> So that's basically what, what we know of Latin education in Anglo-Saxon England. Very cool. Now, moving us forward, an Anglo-Saxon scholar mm -hmm. in the 19th century named Henry Sweet, who is one of the models upon which Henry Higgins in uh, My Fair Lady. Alien uh, yeah. has based, he was not only a scholar of Anglo-Saxon, but more generally a, a, linguistic, a linguist mm -hmm. who wrote other kinds of grammatical books about contemporary language and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so there's an interesting article that I read by Mark Atherton, who looked at Sweet's ideas about language instruction and mm -hmm. what would work best. And his idea is that language instruction should use synthesis, grasping sentences as wholes. Mm. Part of this came out of his, so one of the things that he was a specialist in is phonetics. Right. Hence the Henry Higgins yeah. stuff. Yeah. And so he was in particular motivated by the idea that speech doesn't come in distinct words. It comes as a sort of stream of sound without pauses between words. Right. right? So we don't think about them as words. We think about the yeah. whole When you read, of, you yeah. see words separated on a page, but when you hear it, you don't hear it that way. So right. he thought the best approach was therefore to think in whole sentences, to teach in whole sentences. And he par also partly based this idea on the way that he saw that Latin was taught in Anglo-Saxon England. Hmm. So in particular, he had in mind that bit from the preface, Alfred's, Alfred's preface to the pastoral the care. The sense by sense. The sense by sense. And in particular, I think he thought the, the meaning by meaning he took as kind of sentence by sentence as right. the right approach. Well, sense is, yeah, okay, yeah. So he therefore su suggested that the language learner should avoid analytical methods mm. early on. That could come later, but when studying early on, you shouldn't do any analytical. And what you mean by analytical is looking and saying that's what the case ending is, or, yeah. oh, that's the present tense, or... Diagramming the sentence or anything or, like that. Or yeah. identifying the particular grammatical element of each word. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, what agrees with what and right. all of that kind of stuff. He stressed the usefulness of dialogues and colloquies, like they mm -hmm. obviously used in the Middle Ages, and suggested that vocabulary uh, could be taught through class glossaries. So words listed by groups of related vocabulary. Here's a bunch of words that have to, to do, do with farming. With, or, yeah. And so he kind of stressed that Latin should be taught more as a living language. That, as if it were. As if it were a living language. Right. Teach it in a kind of, this kind of. You know, conversational okay. way. And I guess that's something that at least some teachers today uh, definitely, will definitely put yeah. into practice. Yeah. As I was saying to you just a moment ago off mic, I don't know whether to talk about this now or in a more developed discussion later, because there is a real, the world of Latin pedagogy, Latin in particular, I think that's yeah. Is there in Greek too, but there really is a much stronger focus on it in Latin because Latin is taught so much more in high schools, especially in the yeah. United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot more talking about how to teach children or young teenagers, or young whatever. young yeah. people, young people Latin. Uh, Latin. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of debate about it, and there's a lot of discussion, a lot of new pedagogical methods, a lot of new approaches, and. This method that we are talking about from the ancient world, you know, it hasn't changed that much. Mm -hmm. And it was reintroduced and continuous. And a lot of people have understandably said, well, you know, just because we've been doing it for 2000 years doesn't mean it is actually the best way to do it, especially within a very different context for why you would learn it. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing when you're learning a, le a second language is the motivation. If you have a strong motivation, right. you will learn it under almost any circumstances. Yeah. And you could say that in the classical world, there was a very strong motivation because the economic importance of it and social importance of it was right. so strong that you would do it. We don't have, and then, you know, even in the 19th century, that was true. In the We'd, Middle Ages, they had those beatings to motivate. Yeah, them, well, and, so. and they had religious, religious reasons, reasons and economic yes. reasons. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now the context is that nobody needs to learn Latin. Right. You know, as a base level, no one needs to. Mm -hmm. There is no strong economic or social necessity for learning Latin. So when a, when you have a student in a classroom who has decided that they are willing to learn Latin, without that motivation, mm -hmm. you now need to sort of really focus on your pedagogy. You can't assume they're going to 
do it no matter do it what. no matter what no matter how you teach it to them they'll figure out a way to learn it that's not going to happen now so there's a lot more concentration on pedagogy and i i have no problem with that at all i think that's great mm-hmm. um there's a lot of debate about whether you can teach Latin like you teach living languages. Mm-hmm. I and mean, that's really the sort of the reality core is of it the isn't discussion. a living language. No, it isn't a living no language. There are no native speakers of Latin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But to what degree can you teach it as a sort of like in the Anglo Saxon period as a fluent, yeah, non living but fluent language, second mm-hmm. language? Can you become fluent in it? Is that, a, is that an aim? And, and also, is that what you should aim at? Mm-hmm. Is aiming for fluency or learning through fluency mm-hmm. a good use of your time? Because that's the other thing everybody's limited in the amount of time that they, they can spend on. It. Right. So that's sort of the real debate right now. I do think it might be interesting to talk to somebody who does the living Latin. So the one of the one of the ends of the spectrum is uh, the living Latin approach, mm-hmm. which is trying to teach Latin as a living language and and also to to some degree revive it as living language. Now not as a first language. Mm-hmm. I don't know of anybody who's trying to teach their babies to speak in Latin. Mm-hmm. But, you know, trying to develop adult fluency mm-hmm. in Latin and to teach children and kids and teenagers in school mm-hmm. from a fluency based perspective. Uh, so I think, we, you know, maybe we'll try to there are lots of people who are doing that that we could probably talk to. So I think maybe we should try to talk to that mm-hmm. someone about that. On the other end of the spectrum, <laughs> amusingly, perhaps Eleanor Dickey, who I just talked about, has taken those materials from Egypt and put them together into an introductory Latin textbook. Mm-hmm that uses the exercises from those papyri the ancient world. Right. and basically sort of says, like, why not try to learn Latin the way Greek speaking people in Egypt were learning Latin? Mm-hmm. They were learning Latin in a context in which le- Latin was living. Mm-hmm. So even though they weren't first language learners, mm-hmm. the Latin around them, the Latin they were working with, you know, they had access to a living Latin. So why not use their exercises and their approaches? So there is a textbook that if anybody's interested in, you can, and she's, you know, put it together as a proper textbook so that you can use it with exercises and tests and things. Learn Latin from the Romans by Eleanor Dickey. So, you know, I don't do either of those in the classroom myself, but I am trying to incorporate some of the understanding of living Latin. Mm -hmm. I see the benefits of some of it. There's also something called comprehensible input. Okay. Do you know that? No, I don't Just know that one. Overlaps with what living Latin is, but the idea behind comprehensible uh, language is that it is comprised of six main hypotheses. The essence of this can be condensed into three fundamental pillars. Instruction should be comprehensible, compelling, and caring. So, in language acquisition, you we acquire language and develop literacy when we understand the message. Acquisition happens gradually and occurs best when texts are very comprehensible. So you need to write texts and students need to have a lot of input Mm -hmm. that they can understand what it says. Right. You know, a lot of it rather than analytical. Right. Essentially. Very broad. But therefore, probably not great to teach today's students through you know, reading Virgil or something. Well, in, indeed. So this is why I find it, I say two ends of the spectrum. Culturally... Too much That's why yeah. I say, yeah, well, and that's, that's certainly the premise behind rewriting texts for students in textbooks now. Even mm-hmm. when they use the Latin context, mm-hmm. they try to nonetheless put it into sort of, leave out the stuff that's particularly alien to students. Right. But that is some of the comprehensible input is a big part of the living Latin idea that what you do is you sit and do, you know, you do exercises and stuff in class based on what students know about. Right. The flip side of that is they end up learning an awful lot of vocabulary for things they're never going to need when they read Latin. Yeah. Right. So it's. Yeah. You so know, again, that's it's the balance. What, what is it's, the point? What's why? What are is you, your yeah. goal? In, what in is your goal Latin? in learning Latin? And of course, that could totally be your goal to mm-hmm. to be able to be fluent in Latin. Is not. I'm not saying this. You know, why is that any worse of a goal than learning to read Virgil? Who mm-hmm. needs to learn Virgil? Mm-hmm. You know, so it depends. And that's why there's, I think, a bit of a divide between the high school and the university right. context. When students come into university and want to learn Latin so that they can go on to do classics, they're very focused and we have a certain amount of time and we're very focused on getting them to the point where they can read an ancient text. So do they want to know all the words for all the objects in their physical classroom when literally none of those words are going to come up in a Ciceronian oration. Mm -hmm. You know, how much does it matter? But on the other hand, if you spend all your time learning all the words in the Ciceronian oration, but none of them stick because it's not comprehensible to you, Mm -hmm. then you're still wasting your time. 
Mm-hmm. So that would be the argument on the other side of that, right? Like, it doesn't matter if this is an important vocab. If you're actually learning how to understand Latin, mm-hmm. you're not wasting your time. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of the, you know, there's a lot more you could say about comprehensible input. It's a whole theory. Mm-hmm. And it's one that I'm sympathetic to. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think they're necessarily wrong that this is how we learn language better. Like, I think yeah. I think that almost certainly that's true. Yeah. We are best at learning language when we have mode and they're either the caring and comprehensible, compelling and caring. Right. Compelling, as in you have a re- you care about what the content is, so you want to know it, and that's mm-hmm. where they come to the motivation. You'll figure out how to read the words or what the sentence says because you want to know the answer or you want to know what happens next in the story. And caring—that's about pedagogical content, about being caring to your students and mm-hmm. making it not, you know, allowing them to take risks by making it a low stakes, low right. stress environment. I don't disagree with any of that. I I I am very willing to be convinced that that is how people best learn languages. Mm-hmm. The question is whether you can do that in a classroom. What the time it takes to do it mm-hmm. is the, this. I'm reading from an article that I'll link in the show notes. But the exercise that they have here is you know you watch a movie clip, you narrate the movie clip, you stop, you pause, you ask questions in Latin about the movie. They answer in Latin, then you watch it again, then you go back and you do it again and ask more questions, right. like totally sounds great like you ask them what do you think is going to happen and then at the end they finally see the end of the movie clip like mm-hmm. it totally makes sense but it would take an entire class yeah and i have 26 classes in a term mm-hmm. can i take up that time for mm-hmm. them to learn seven words of vocabulary mm-hmm. on the other hand if i don't and they never learn any of the vocabulary because they have such trouble learning my language the language the way i'm teaching it yeah maybe seven words is seven words mm-hmm. so so yeah yeah, I mean, I've I've never taught Latin in that way either. Mm-hmm. I've taught it in the sort of reading Latin mm-hmm. kind of method, mm-hmm. and I've taught also the more analytical mm-hmm. approach. When teaching Old English, of course, it's a bit different, at least when teaching Old English to native English speakers, mm-hmm. because there you can rely on their nat- intuition, their intuition mm-hmm. about English. And so a lot of it is just pointing out Okay, here's how Old English is different from Modern English. Yeah. Watch for this. You didn't pay attention to this little difference here that yeah. does make a difference. You have to notice this. Yeah. yeah. Whereas when you're teaching an English speaker how to read Latin, mm-hmm. you know, all their intuitions are wrong. Yeah. This is an, and this is part of the sort of living Latin approach, like trying to sort of reset those intuitions. Every one of my students tries to read an, a Latin sentence and start with the first word as the nominative, as the subject. As the subject, yeah. And it's almost always the object and so they get it wrong and then they try to the first word that looks like it might be a verb they translate it as a verb right. because they want the verb to come up front because mm-hmm. in english our verbs come yeah. up front yeah. but the verb in latin usually comes at the end so just very basic things like that their intuition about how language works is wrong mm-hmm. and in my experience if you don't work on that in an in mm-hmm. in an analytical way they just keep getting it wrong and i don't know like right. you know they can think they've understood a phrase and everything, and it's completely backwards or wrong mm-hmm. or whatever. So, I, yeah, this continues to be a, a frustration with me, though, because I don't feel like I've done a fabulous job of teaching Latin mm-hmm. ever, frankly. Like, I don't I've, I've had students who've learned Latin well, but most of the ones who've learned the Latin the best for me, I feel like they would have, as we were saying, no matter how I taught, right. they would have learned it. I think. You know, the the problems are more systemic, of mm-hmm. course, because you just don't have the classroom time no. to learn a language, any language, really. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, to, you know, three hours, three hours a week mm-hmm. for 26 weeks and 24 weeks in a year. Mm-hmm. How much language can you learn? But that said, I'm totally open to there being better ways of doing it than the way they did it 2,000 years ago in Egypt. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, yeah. So that anyway, this is something we'll we'll keep pondering and maybe we can talk about that. And I do, you know, I do play some of the podcasts from Living Latin People right. in my classroom. I we're we're doing a pen pal uh, exchange with another university this year where we're trying to write about the, mm-hmm. that's comprehensible input, right? It's talking right. about our city and what Sudbury looks like, right. and, you know, trying to do that. And they're telling us about Philadelphia and so I'm trying to add little bits of that into my class as supplemental, mm-hmm. but it's not fundamentally changing the way I'm teaching at the moment, so yeah, it's an ongoing struggle. And I guess the thing to acknowledge, of course, is that you and I mainly learned through analytical... Oh, absolutely. I mean, 
the textbooks we used did have, you know, reading passages and stuff. They weren't only sentences. Mm -hmm. I didn't do Wheelock, so I didn't do the sentences. But yeah. Well, we started with the Cambridge, both both you and mm -hmm. I. For Latin. Yeah. For Latin. Mm -hmm. Which um, tells stories, mm -hmm. and it, it, it is intended to be, you know, it's quite clearly whether they were used, I don't think they used comprehensible input as a pedagogical theory. I don't think it had been formulated no. quite. But, you know, it is pretty comprehensible, and mm -hmm. it is intended to be compelling. Yes, stories, stories about individual yeah. characters that you start to follow and get to know, yeah. and, and, and it worked. We, you know, we got hooked on them as, mm -hmm. as students. And uh, I'm not sure caring environment is quite the right word to use for our <laughs> Latin teacher. He cared about us learning, that's yeah. for sure. And we all liked him, but he was. But it was a risk. It was a yeah. place where risk taking felt pretty risky. Right. <laughs> but certainly, when I went on to learn Old English and Old mm -hmm. Norse, it was very much straight you know, analytical. Okay, yeah. Here's and then, a bunch of paradigms. Here's yeah, and same with me in university. Yeah. And we both succeeded in spite of or because of that, and therefore we became teachers for whom that's very natural. So it's mm -hmm. it's a hard it's hard to shift one's approach. But, all right. I think we need to stop. <laughs> We've spent far too long talking about this. Apologies for the length. We'll include in the show notes all the references that we yeah. mentioned. Yeah, so you yeah. Can... various works. Yeah. Clearly what's going to happen is if we're only going to do this once every month, we're going to have far too much to say. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we will uh, be back in October, hopefully to talk about something Halloween-y. Yeah. I would think so. Cannot remember for the life of me. Or possibly to do an interview. We've got some interviews we want to do. We haven't arranged yeah. them, but we need to want to do some interviews. So, but we'll certainly do a Halloween episode. Yeah, and uh, maybe an interview as well. And maybe an interview as well. Yeah. All right. Thanks for listening. Bye bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.